Oh, the Blasio? <laughs> well, thank you all. Welcome back. Uh, a, a very good, very eventful morning. And we'll get right into it. We have a very, very special guest joining us this afternoon, uh, a man who has come up from New York City to join us today. We're very happy to have uh, the mayor of New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio. Mr. Mayor. Horse and I would like to ta uh, thank uh, Lieutenant Governor for his leadership. Of course, want to talk about in a moment my appreciation for the Governor for all that's being done here today. But thank you to the Lieutenant Governor. Thank you to all my colleagues in government, all the county executives that are here, and the state legislators, and all the members of the executive branch, and everyone involved in New York Rising. Uh, this is really something encouraging and extraordinary, the collaborative effort that's leading us forward as we prepare for a very different world than the one we knew a few years ago. And Governor, the New York rising effort obviously indicates strongly your commitment to all the communities that were hit by Sandy, to all communities that have to prepare for this challenging future. You know, as many people know, Governor and I started working together now. It'll be 20 years ago next May, I think it is. You're getting old. <laughs> ah. It's great to be with you. <laughs> so, the, when we started working together at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, the notion that there was something uh, challenging this whole world in terms of climate change was just, just starting to be felt fully. But if you said back then that today we'd have to be, all of us, so profoundly focused on resiliency in all we do, I would have thought you know, maybe, maybe that was an alarmist vision. Today we know it's common sense that resiliency has to run through all of our thinking. And Governor, your leadership, not only in the aftermath of Sandy and helping communities get back on their feet, but on the way you've talked from the beginning, in a, in a very sober, realistic way about this challenge. I think it's helped all of us around the state to put resiliency thinking front and center into the work we do. We all have this dual reality. We have to continue to help people back on their feet. And Lord knows, after almost 18 months, I can say on behalf of so many people in New York City, we're still struggling to make sure people are whole and their lives are fully back together. But the work of resiliency is here and now, it's every day. We don't get a memo that tells us when the next storm's gonna hit or what it's gonna look like. So what's happening today is so important and I commend it. I'm also here because we have to do a little more to help some folks who are struggling. And I'm very proud today to talk about the property tax relief legislation that's being introduced into the legislature at my request. And I want to say at the outset, I want to thank you, Governor, for your support for that legislation. It means a lot to the people of New York City. Because, ironically, a lot of people have struggled to get back on their feet, to rebuild, often at great expense to themselves. And what happens upon getting back on their feet, rebuilding their home, Unfortunately, according to our current <coughs> tax laws, they would be assessed at a much higher level and suddenly be hit with a much higher property tax after all the trouble they had gone through. The legislation I'm putting forward is crucial because it will allow us to provide property tax relief to not have these good, hardworking people penalized simply because they were able finally to get their homes rebuilt and get back on their feet. We don't want to put them into a situation where their good efforts are suddenly penalized, uh, especially after 18 months of hard work. Uh, we're going to continue to work closely with the governor, to work closely with the state on all the efforts of rebuilding. We know that some of this is about making sure that people have the financial relief. Some of it is the work we do on a bigger level in government, rebuilding community institutions. There's a whole host of things all the while focusing on the work of resiliency as well. I want to thank everyone, just a point of privilege, if I may, the hardworking folks at the New York City Legislative Office in Albany who have really worked intensely with the governor's team, with 
the legislative leaders on this property tax relief bill. And I'm thrilled to say that right off the bat we have strong bipartisan support for this notion. And I think that's a great example of what can happen when there's that spirit of unity in this capital on behalf of people who have been through so much. So just want to say, Governor, this is a really encouraging day for the State of New York. I know throughout the day you've heard wonderful, innovative ideas uh, of people moving forward from the grassroots. I know you believe, and I've known this about you for two decades, you believe in uplifting and supporting the grassroots, people innovating on the ground, knowing what will work best for them and that the role of government is to be there with them as they do that. So it's a good day for New York State. Thank you again for all the support you've given New York City, and it's my honor to be here with you. <laughs> Give another round of applause to Mayor Bill de Blasio for being here today. <laughs> Mayor was saying 20 years ago we were at HUD, 20 years. I remember when my parents would say, I've known that person 20 <laughs> years. It was like unimaginable that you could know someone 20 years. I used to think as a kid, someone's gonna die soon if you've known them for 20 years. And now Bill and I have known each other 20 years. What happened to us? We were young, we were free. We were young, we were free. <laughs> now we're not, let's just say that. <laughs> Bill and I met, we were just, uh, just starting out, just having babies, they're going to college, so uh, it's been a whole lifetime together. We're at the Department of Housing and Urban Development together, as, as the mayor mentioned. And uh, what, what you have accomplished today, community development, uh, was the high art form at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And we have tremendous respect for what you've done and, and when it's done well. We also did, uh, as you see here today, the disaster assistance at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, the way HUD is helping us here, that was HUD's role uh, back then also. We were all over the country. North Ridge earthquakes in California, Red River flood in the Midwest part of the country. Uh, we did disaster assistance. President Clinton sent us out of the country. We went to uh, Dominican Republic. We went to Ecuador. We went to Haiti to do disaster assistance. And I remember thinking to myself, this will never come in handy back home because <laughs> disasters don't happen in New York, right? There are no hurricanes or floods back in New York. That was then and this is now. Uh, and as the mayor said, it is a different reality. Um, the, the expression 100-year floods now happen every three years, right? Yeah. So to assume that this isn't going to happen again would be a fool's errand, and we're doing the opposite. Assume it will happen again and make sure we're in a better position uh, the next time around. And that's what this morning has been all about, and that's what you've been doing. Uh, so with that, let's get back to the program. We have more presentations to make, uh, more work to do, and I'll turn it over to Lieutenant Governor Jamie Rubin. Not Lieutenant Governor Jamie Rubin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's how a Lieutenant Governor is made. <laughs> <laughs> this was not what I expected when I woke up this morning. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Mayor, we're, hearing, uh, we're in the middle of hearing some presentations from communities on uh, organized thematically. The next theme is uh, community resiliency. The communities that recover best from natural disasters are the ones with strong community institutions, nonprofits, and community groups that drive emergency preparedness and shelter and feed people in need. Many of you proposed community resilience projects that will build the capacity of these vital institutions that step in where government cannot. Such projects have been proposed across the state by, among others, the Lower Manhattan Committee, Prattsville, Town and Village of Nichols, and the Village of Owego, and Village of Sargates. Danelle Johnson and Gita Nandan are going to explain their community resiliency proposal from the Brooklyn Red Hook Committee. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Danelle Johnson, and I would like to say thank you very much, uh, Governor, for having us here. <clears throat> We're going to talk about. Uh, Resiliency, and if anyone knows, I'll give you a little bit of history of my background. I'm from public housing all of my life. I've lived in Red Hook, I've lived in Brevoit. And um, I'm saying this to say that I don't get involved in anything that I don't love, or I'm not committed to, or I can't be passionate to. And so when I was asked to be here to represent public housing 
or vulnerable populations is what, what I would do. Um, I took it very serious because living in public housing is not just about resiliency. Um, a lot of times that was all we had. So when Sandy hit, it's one thing if you had resources to go back to and support and sustain, but there was no sustainability because you go from being vulnerable to being totally scared. And um, I bring that up to say that there was a young lady uh, that you helped, a family, and she was totally scared. And she cried and she cried and she told me she called you, your office, and you helped her. They, she was stuck in a homeless shelter and you got her into Chelsea and you helped bring her food, her and her family food and um, furniture, and now she is now up and running. So it's more than just resiliency, which you did, you saved a life. Um, so I'm speaking really about that. Um, what we're doing in our way when you're dealing with vulnerable populations, you're doing more than resiliency. Some of these people never had anything, and so you're saving lives. And so with that being said, I'm gonna pass this to Jita. And, uh, so the impact on the New York City Housing Authority was severe and sustained. Um, in Red Hook, which is in South Brooklyn, New York City, um, over 80% or 70% of the population lives in NYCHA housing. It's about 8,000 out of our 11,000 residents. Um, there were prolonged power outages caused by flooded infrastructure, which left the vulnerable population stranded without heat, hot water, lights, um, for months, um, and some NYCHA houses are actually still dependent on boilers and generators to this day. So reflecting on this impact, uh, our committee came up with two strategies um, that relates. So increase the physical and economic resiliency of both private and public housing, create opportunities for alternative and redundant power generation and distribution. So stemming from these strategies, two projects were formed. The first is solar-powered emergency lights in the stairwells of the Red Hook houses, both east and west. And the second, a feasibility study identifying the potential for a microgrid at the Red Hook houses. Um, with implementation of the project would hopefully take place after the feasibility study um, with the <coughs> identification of specific funding. The solar-powered light pilot project shown in the diagram on the left suggests installing power panels and backup batteries on two or three buildings in the Red Hook houses to power backup lighted, um, lighting located within the stairwells. In the event of a power outage, um, people would be able to find their way, uh, which was actually a real sincere problem um, when the storm hit. There's plenty of roof space and we have great sun, sun exposure because these houses actually are the highest in the neighborhood, um, so they have, um, they're really great candidates for this type of technology. <clears throat> the implementation of solar as a selected method of power complements um, the committee's goal for carbon neutral solutions. That was a really big issue in our committee. Um, why do solutions if they're, not, if they're gonna aid to global warming? Um, so uh, when we're looking for options to solve resiliency issue, we're also looking for <coughs> carbon neutral solutions. Uh, if, su if successful, we hope that NYCHA will follow suit um, and expand this pilot project across all 30 buildings. Related to this concept is the potential integration of a microgrid to supply power for all of the Red Hook houses. We propose funding a study to evaluate the feasibility of creating a microgrid powered by a local energy source to ensure power resiliency for the Red Hook houses. Some of the notable um, community features that we have came up with was small entrepreneur businesses, uh, maritime industry, industrial activity, open space, and a diverse growing, for a diverse growing population. Aside from that, aside from that, direct benefits of protecting vulnerable populations in case of another emergency. Both of these projects could also benefit Red Hook through an, an environmental, social, and ec economic lens. Red Hook Committee sees environmental benefits in supporting the use of alternative energy sources such as solar power. Supporting the potential for employment and job training opportunities and trades and professions focused on green technologies is another key benefit and prior, priority to our, our committee. We hope to marry these concepts with the, with the expansion of workforce development programs, creating opportunities for young residents and out of the Red Hook, out of the Red Hook houses to grow professionally with roles on the project implementation. I um, like to say that 
I support two of your programs that you actually can combine. Your Startup New York program with the Resiliency program will actually support a lot of <coughs> startup businesses who are very much needed, minority businesses, women businesses, and businesses from public housing for first-time business owners. So I commend you. Beautiful. Thank you. So questions, comments? Very nicely done, uh, if I might jump in. Very nicely done. Uh, thank you both very much. It's, uh, it's smart, it's innovative, it's exactly what we're looking for. Will you, uh, will this grant, will you have the funds necessary to get this going, or do you need additional funding to get the, the overall project on the solar panels? We, we, we would definitely, um, first of all, thank you for this grant it will definitely get it going. And so we're honorable for that. But to be sustainable, to, be, to become self-sufficient, we would definitely encourage to, be, to have more money. Well, it's a, yeah, it's a question of NYCHA's participation, right? So we need NYCHA to sit at our table and to be a partner with us. Um, the New York Rising money is part of, we have eight pilot, we have eight projects that are proposed. Um, so the pilot would be funded, and then it would really be up to NYCHA working with the pilot project, seeing that it works, and then providing some co-funding to actually make it happen across all 30 buildings. Our um, partner planners uh, came up with dollar figures that seemed reasonable in the light of sort of the need, the emergency need of it, but we really need NYCHA to be a partner with us. Yeah. What people uh, don't tend not to realize, Hurricane Sandy downstate New York City <laughs> my opinion, the worst hit areas were public housing. Yeah. Uh, they are the places that people had the fewest resources to fall back on, fewest alternatives. Uh, they had no place else to go, so they, they stayed in that housing. The way the housing is designed, it was not designed for this type of situation. Power goes out in public housing. It is a desperate situation very quickly. Uh, the physical plant is dangerous when it's dark. Heating went out. I mean, it was terrible. The elevators went out. You had people having to walk down 25 stories uh, just to get a meal, just to get water. The facilities didn't work. It was a really horrendous situation, and it went on a very, very long time. Uh, so the mayor and I, you should know, have been talking about uh, real changes in public housing along these lines to make sure it doesn't happen again. If I may add, just real quickly, <clears throat> one of the things we used to work on back almost 20 years ago was public housing, and obviously, uh, since the administration we were a part of, since the Clinton administration left office, uh, it's been tough for public housing in terms of some of the disinvestment that happened in the years immediately after the Clinton administration. And we're now all trying to grapple with that together. The governor's entirely right. We've been left a very tough environment to deal with. A lot of people that you represent are living it every day. I just want to commend you. I think this is a fantastic proposal. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad it's getting the support here. Uh, I want to make sure that we get you together with the new uh, chairperson of the Housing Authority, uh, <coughs> Shola Alate. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is very focused on questions of resiliency, uh, use of alternative energy, energy retrofits, very kindred things to what you're doing. Want to see how we can start working together with you on that. And just finally, you know, in the <coughs> Uh, time after Sandy, about two weeks <coughs> after, I, I wanted to understand what was happening uh, in Red Hook. I went to Red Hook East houses and went up through some of the stairwells. And again, I, I think so many people in the city, in the state, had a broad sense of what people were going through. But as the governor just indicated, people plunged into darkness for weeks on end, including seniors, including disabled people. It was an incredibly disruptive, difficult time. And we owe it to people to show them that we're not going to let that happen again, use every tool we know uh, to make sure that doesn't happen again. That's why today is so important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Catherine McVeigh Hughes. I'm the co-chair for the Lower Manhattan uh, Committee. First of all, I want to thank our governor uh, for the support and leadership. Um, 
during and post Sandy and for the staff that you provided our committee during this process. I also want to thank Mayor de Blasio for your support as well. In terms of your proposal at Red Hook, um, in Lower Manhattan, Superstorm Sandy caused widespread power outages that disproportionately impacted the vulnerable populations, including senior and disabled residents. Our committee made it a priority to propose projects that would protect vulnerable populations and help build the capacity of community-based organizations that played a key role in the recovery of Lower Manhattan. One project we have proposed would fund a network of hardened community recovery centers, as well as provide grants for technical and financial assistance programs to the CBOs to implement the functions of community emergency preparedness plans. Regarding the Red Hook Houses microgrid study, do you see the potential for the microgrid to power other critical facilities or residences beyond the Red Hook Houses? Um, ideally, it will. Um, that's what the feasibility study will prove, <laughs> how much we can get out of the microgrid um, and how much power is required by the NYCHA housing. There is actually one of our community facilities that's one of our um, centers, recovery centers, is actually part of NYCHA housing, so that would ideally be part of the package. But the feasibility study will really show us sort of what the capacity is going to be of the microgrid itself. Thank you. There's a lot of NYCHA housing also on the Lower East yeah, Side. Yeah, ideally this will become a pilot project that can be um, used across the city in all sorts of different types of NYCHA housing projects. I would, I would say, and I'm going to take it back on that, I would say that um, absolutely yes, because I think that even as it being a pilot project, pro Coney Island, far, uh, far Rockaway, all of your area, all the areas that were impacted by this, right now at the grassroots level, we should be doing that together from the, from the beginning. Whether, you know, you can't look at it as a Red Hook thing because this is a, a universal thing, and we should start it together um, because ultimately, like, it's, it's gonna affect, it affects us now, so definitely. Thanks a lot. Yes. That's a really great idea. I wonder, why didn't, why didn't we think of it when we were there? <laughs> <laughs> why didn't we have I'll speak loudly. No, it's on. My name is Mary Shealy. I'm a member of the Ulster County Communities Committee, and to my right is Julia Robbins, the co-chair of that committee. Governor, thank you so much for your leadership and your vision for bringing this program to fruition on such a short timetable. I'm very pleased to be sitting here celebrating my 48th wedding anniversary with you. But <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. This You'll remember this one. <laughs> yeah, this is true. So will my husband. <laughs> uh, Elster County is very different from Red Hook, but we shared the experience of going days and in some instances weeks without power. Irene and Lee taught us the hard way um, at how critical power generation is to disaster response and recovery. In the Ulster Planning Committee, we looked at a variety of ways to build resiliency into our communities, from hardening our wastewater treatment plants, street <coughs> management, and making our roads and bridges stronger. We are even proposing to build resiliency into our parks to protect our communities. Many of our projects address the need for backup power. The idea of a microgrid is very interesting, and I wonder, can you tell us more about how it would keep power going in the Red Hook neighborhood? Um, well, ideally, it will be a self-sufficient kind of system. Um, microgrids um, are actually being sponsored by NYSERDA right now. Um, they're doing some pilot projects also. So um, what kind of fuel will have to be seen during the feasibility study? There could be, there are microgrids that are waste to power. Um, there are also natural gas microgrids. Um, we haven't decided because we have to determine sort of through the feas feasibility study what is both cost effective meets sort of our most carbon neutral options um, and just sort of what is going to get us the best power options. But there are already m many microgrids out there, um, so there are a lot of precedents that can be looked at. Um, and I think ideally our feasibility study can also then be used by other communities to at least use as a launching point um, to understand what kind of options they have. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Next category is economic development. 
The economic development projects that your communities <coughs> proposed help, will help waterfront economies recover and rebuild after a disaster. They include downtown revitalization and resiliency planning, workforce development and resiliency <coughs> training programs, industrial development planning, reconstruction of commercial docks, and business district streetscape improvements. Innovative proposals along these lines have been generated by, <laughs> among others, Baldwin, Fire Island, Rockaway West, <coughs> Southern Brooklyn, and the village of Freeport. I'll ask uh, Aldine Moore and Jose Velez if I could impose on them to walk us through the Queens Rockaway East <coughs> plan. John. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to share one of our exciting concepts with you all. My name is Al Moore. I'm co-chair of the Rockaway East Committee. And money. Just, just in case you don't get a chance to ask us if we need more money, we need more money. <laughs> My name is Jose Velez. I'm a member of the Rockaway East uh, Committee, as well as a uh, member of the local community board. The Rockaway East planning area is one of three on the Rockaway Peninsula in Queens and is comprised of four distinct neighborhoods, Auburn, Edgemere, Bayswater, and Far Rockaway. Running from Beach 74th Street to the Nassau County border, much of the community was impacted by Superstorm Sandy. The map on the left shows the concentration of flooding from both the Atlantic Ocean and Jamaica Bay. Superstorm Sandy revealed many critical issues, all of which inspired the strategies within the plan we were able to create with the community, with the community reconstruction programs. Today we are going to focus on the need for economic revitalization and support uh, for yes, small business. Exactly right. Issues worsened by Superstorm Sandy include a fragile economy, high unemployment, and beaches and bayside areas that are underutilized. With these issues in mind, the, the committee decided that, it would, that we need to leverage our existing attractions, natural resources, connect these assets to transit and commercial centers, find ways to support and develop local businesses, and employment opportunities. The Rockaway East Committee is proposing the development of a seasonal container market to help meet these needs. We envision this shipping container market to be in a prominent location accessible to both visitors and residents to showcase quality, qual quality local businesses from throughout the eastern end of the Rockaway Peninsula. This proposed project would grow seasonal businesses along the beach in our community and create an, attack, an attraction for local and tourists alike and include elements such as a green market. <clears throat> there are several precedents for a small neighborhood-centric container market across New York City, including the DeKalb Market in downtown Brooklyn and the Sea Change Market at the South Street Seaport in Lower Manhattan, which came to life after Superstorm Sandy impacted many of the businesses in that area. A beachfront example can be seen at Asbury Park in New Jersey, where the container-based retail shops have been established along its historic waterfront. Spaces would be included for both one-person micro-businesses without a physical space to small retail shops and restaurants seeking a beachfront access. While improving the local <laughs> economy, and drawing attention to the variety of businesses throughout the area, <coughs> this project would also improve access to quality, healthy mm -hmm. food. In addition, we see the market as a small business incubator, giving individuals a place where they can develop and test their products. <coughs> Superstorm, super, Superstorm Sandy <laughs> had a widespread impact on our community which we're still recovering from, but, it's, but it also provided an opportunity for connectivity and collaboration among the many diverse residents, community-based organizations, and business. We feel innovative physical spaces like this market will leverage these connections and support a thriving community. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Questions or comments? Yes, I have one, uh, Governor. Um, I would like to start off with a statement first. Governor Cuomo, your leadership and support for the Village of Freeport. Uh, my name is Dewey Smalls. I'm one of the co-chairs. And Mr. Rob Weltner uh, couldn't make it today because he had a previous engagement. Yeah. But um, I just want to make sure that you heard of his name because he's, he's an incredible guy. But your leadership, Governor, has meant so much to Long Island. To see you out there giving us advice, reassuring us that we're going to be okay and that we will rebuild was invaluable. And to my county exec, Mr. Ed Mangano, thank you for coming to Freeport. For our residents to see you on Nautical Mile where we were hit the most in South Freeport, it was incredible to see you down there reassuring to us that we're going to be okay and we're going to build better. So thank you. Thank you. To Mr. Moore and Mr. Velez, on behalf of the second largest village in the state of New York, in the Honorable Robert Kennedy and the 43,000 residents that were affected by Superstorm Sandy, your innovative proposal is interesting. We have four major assets in Freeport. We have our downtown that we're looking at. We have Nautical Mile. We have Industrial Park and the power plants. <clears throat> the economic portion of your proposal made a lot of sense to us because we want to start focusing on the Industrial Park. It's underutilized. It was heavily damaged with, with the surge of water coming in. <laughs> And a lot of small businesses in that area are having a hard time regenerating or getting themselves back up to full speed. We want to expand and bolster the, uh, the industrial park. The question that I have for you is, with mitigation measures offering protection from the water, we are hoping to make it a thriving area for us in Freeport. Can you talk more about the temporary market you propose and how would you handle the long-term impact <clears throat> to the local economy in initiating this, uh, this new uh, proposal? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, <coughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take that question. The placement of the container market is key. Uh, we wouldn't want to put it in the lowest, lowest lying area in Rockaway because that becomes even more pro problematic and maybe even a little stupid on our part. But for the stores that exist now, um, there, there are ways to keep the water from infiltrating. Uh, one of the buildings that received the least amount of damage received that received being spared because they put plywood. <coughs> over the doors and the windows and then sealed it. And they had very little damage. As far as uh, trying to improve the economy or keep the small business economy, you have to grow one first. We have a lot of people that just lost everything. Um, they're now looking for a place to start back. And if we can give them that assistance, then we've done our share. Yeah. Jamie, can I just jump in for a sec? I, I just, this last point you made is so important. Um, I spent a lot of time in the Rockaways after the storm, and you, you remember in some of the communities what happened to the small businesses, how really <laughs> devastating it was, the fires, you know, the things that I think uh, were not fully understood again in all of the public imagination. It wasn't just water came and went. Yeah, it, was, it was in so many cases businesses that were knocked out for good or for a very long period of time. I think the thing you just said is powerful, regenerating that spirit of entrepreneurship, that sense of possibility. That's why I love, I love your proposal. And again, want to see how we can be helpful because it's um, the most grassroots way of helping people either get their business back in gear with new markets, new uh, clientele, or for folks who have been wanting to break through, it's a really accessible way 
to start their own business. And I think the, what we've seen with these markets in other places, I think you're exactly right. It's a proven model and one that would, I think, add to the sense of community. I don't need to preach to you about community in the Rockways. People have been absolutely extraordinary, extraordinary neighbors helping neighbors in the most amazing ways, some very heroic efforts. But I think in terms of deepening that sense of community as people rebuild, this would be a, a really great focal point. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to add that some of the destroyed buildings and businesses that were not able to regenerate themselves when they were torn down, it makes it look like there was no real problem here. But that, that site is still a problem, and we, we need to give them assistance. Okay. If I may, Governor, I'd just like to make this one statement. Um, I want to send yes, Ms. Marinella <laughs> Jordan, Ms. Laura Renifo, <coughs> Ms. Nancy Rux, <coughs> Mr. Vincent Racia, Mr. Trent Lithgow, thank you. Your words of support and encouragement were invaluable. And I will always, always be grateful. <sighs> I don't like to say goodbye, so until the next time, be well and God bless. Thank you very much, Mr. Smalls. Okay, we're going to move to the last category, uh, which is infrastructure upgrades. <coughs> Infrastructure projects, um, not surprisingly, were very common among our communities. They include rebuilding and replacing bridges, enlarging culverts, raising roads, and hardening water treatment plants across the state. Projects in this category are proposed by, among others, Baldwin Harbor, Barnum Island, City of Binghamton, Copague, Esperance Village, Harbor Isle, Hardenburg, Jay, Margaretville, Middleburg Village, Oceanside, Rotterdam, Schenectady, Shandaken, the town of Nichols, the town of Vestal, the town of Woodstock, the town and village of New Paltz, the village of Island Park, the village of Endicott, and the village of Johnson City. So now for our last presentation, I'm honored to introduce Georgia Van Dyke and Gail Breen, who will walk us through the Schoharie Valleys project. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gail Breen. I am a committee member, but I'm here representing Sarah Goodrich today. Sarah is a way to conference of the Green Shirts, which was the volunteer organization that spent two years in our village. We miss them desperately. We would like to have them back. Uh, they were wonderful volunteers, and Sarah is with them today because they are conducting workshops on how to respond to disasters like this in the future, and they're going to take many of the suggestions that Sarah and the committee have. So we're very pleased that Sarah is not here today, but we're sorry also that she's not here. Uh, anyway, Governor, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. This is a very exciting event for us, and uh, it's the fruition of the first part of this process, certainly not the last part, but the first part. Uh, the Schoharie Valley, New York Rising community consists of six municipalities. We are the villages and towns of Esperance, Middleburg, and Schoharie. We're located in upstate New York. We're just about 40 minutes southwest of here, so we're an easy commute in. Um, many of us were born and grew up in the Schoharie Valley and along the Schoharie Creek, but others of us chose to move here. And we moved here because of the beauty, we moved here because of the quality of life. Um, the natural beauty of the Schoharie Valley is simply unparalleled. You need to come to visit us to really understand it. Um, our communities are predominantly rural in character and home to many dairy, vegetable, and fruit farms and in fact, the new Commissioner of Labor, Richard Ball, is a local farmer and a local friend. Um, we're very pleased to have him part of our community. But in addition, we're also the home to vibrant villages with restaurants and specialty stores. We have small businesses that include advanced manufacturing and pharmaceuticals. And we have museums and other tourist attractions as well. As you can see, our communities were devastated after Hurricane Irene and Tropical Storm Lee. The flooding caused widespread destruction of homes, businesses, agriculture, and public infrastructure. Uh, numerous bridges and roads were flooded, damaged, and in some cases were made impassable, leaving residents in many neighborhoods stranded with no way to reach safer ground. 
One of my neighbors was stranded in his house. He managed to get to the second floor until the fire department could come in a boat and rescue him. He literally had no way out. <coughs> Um, the damage was in part the result of an aging infrastructure and undersized storm drain systems that were overwhelmed by the massive influx of water. And the water that we refer to is not like the water that flows out of our taps every day. This is filthy water. It's contaminated with debris, with sewage, with oil, with gasoline and garbage. And it left our homes and businesses uninhabitable. It was caked not just with mud, but really a toxic, smelly stew. Um, there are papers that I still open today, almost three years later, that you can almost smell it still there. Um, but for the purpose of today's presentation, we're going to highlight, and George is going to take over at this point and talk about um, working with the infrastructure, particularly in the village of Middleburg, which was very vulnerable. And it was because of failing aging infrastructure. Hi, I'm Georgia Van Dyke. Many years ago, Gorge Creek was redirected to flow through a thousand foot long subterranean culvert that runs through the center of the village of Middleburg. The undersized culvert often backs up, causing localized flooding of the local schools, residents, and businesses. This problem is exacerbated by the fact there are no storm drains in the neighborhoods to direct floodwaters out of the area. During Irene and Lee, the extreme water volume in the Gorge Creek simply could not be accommodated by the undersized culvert, and the surrounding schools, homes, and businesses were inundated with floodwaters. The devastation left in the wake of this flooding was severe, and it took months for the village <coughs> to recover. In fact, over two years later, there is still a lot of work to be done to fully rebuild. In the meantime, last summer, we learned the hard way that this was not a one-time occurrence when torrential rains caused the Gorge Creek to back up, again turning Middleburg's Main Street into a roaring river. To address this problem once and for all and create a more resilient stormwater management system, our plan proposes to replace a portion of the existing culvert, the top photo, with a new box culvert. Here we go, whoops. Yeah. Well, there we go. There it is. <laughs> bottom photo <laughs> that would allow a large volume of water to pass through more efficiently with less chance of blockage. In other places, the stream will be rerouted to an open stream bed, which will decrease the odds of future flooding in the Middleburg Village. Our committee also proposes to construct a village stormwater system with sufficient capacity to handle high volume of flood a volume flood and reduce flooding potential for future storm events. This will ensure that flood water ends up in the in, that ends up in the village has a path to flow out again. This comprehensive approach to handling flood water will provide protection to our village, schools, and the public library, village residents, and many of the small businesses in and around Main Street from extreme flooding when the next major storm hits the Schoharie Valley. We are excited by the opportunity to advance projects such as this, one, one through the New York Rising process, uh, process that can achieve so many important co-benefits. The heartbreaking challenges of devastating flood has provided opportunities for all of us, villages, towns, counties, and state working together to restore our villages and towns while making them more resilient in the future. On behalf of the residents of the Schoharie Valley, which is the residents of Esperance, Middleburg, and Schoharie, we thank you. Uh, we all thank you, including Mrs. K, <laughs> a, friend of, a friend of Governor Como's. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this exciting pro uh, process, and thank you also to the wonderful supportive staff from the Department of State. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, George and Gail. Any questions or comments before we conclude this part of the program? Do you have a question? Oh, yes. Yes, good afternoon, Governor Cuomo, Lieutenant Governor, Mayor, Nassau County Executive, Suffolk County Executive, and panel. My name is Ray Pagano, and I'm from Oceanside, co-chair. Um, 
I'd like to first say thank you to you, Governor Cuomo, and your staff, and to you, Nassau County Executive Ed Mangano, and your staff, as well as our Nassau County leader, Laura Manafo, uh, for such a great job, vision, aid, and leadership. I also like to thank the town of Skohari for their presentation on the Gorge Creek culvert repair project. Uh, Oceanside is one of four localities that are part of the group that is located along the south shore of Nassau County. Uh, we have also <coughs> proposed multiple projects in regards to stormwater drainage systems in low-lying areas, uh, roadways, and evac routes. My question is, what considerations went into your thinking for the design of your culverts and stormwater drainage systems? Thank you. Okay, I think the first thing I would like to say to all of you and to remind us as well, we have to learn from our experiences, our prior experiences. For most of this, this was not a first flood. Uh, this is my third flood in less than 30 years. So we need to think about what happened last time and maybe what we didn't do to keep it from happening as severely this time. The second thing I want to say is coming from a farming community, we should know not to put all of our eggs in one basket. <laughs> and uh, that's exactly what we did with Schoharie County. And I can't get back to that last slide, unfortunately. But it shows yeah. the culvert. Um, the culvert was narrow. It was 1,000 feet long, almost a quarter of a mile long, most of it underground. Now. That was supposed to save the whole village from all this flood water and runoff. There you see the one on the top, on the right. That is the culvert that we've been using. It became lodged with debris. It was difficult to clean because it was underground. That all backed up. So we were faced with two things, how to build a better culvert that could disperse the water in a wider area. And then secondly, was that one culvert going to save us in the future, or did we need to look at other uh, additional ways. So this culvert, it's wider, it's easier to keep clean, it will allow more water to go <coughs> through, but at the same time on the other side of that culvert, water will be diverted into pre-existing stream beds. So that will also slow down um, that water. And then finally, as Georgia talked about, uh, we're looking at a series of uh, storm drainage systems that will keep the water from flowing down that one pipeline down the main street of uh, Middleburg, going into the school, going into the church, going into our beautiful new library that's probably less than six years old, <coughs> as well as the homes and villages. So it's really looking at, if not your prior experience, other people's prior experiences, and making sure that the system you design is varied enough and diverse enough so that if one piece of it fails, another piece can pick up that slack. My name is Richard muller -Liley, representing the Shandaken and Hardenburg Committee. In Shandaken and Hardenburg, flooding happens very, very rapidly and often destroys roads and bridges. Our infrastructure is our lifeline, and when it gets damaged or destroyed, residents can be cut off from even the most basic necessities, like food, days, or even weeks. That's why many of the projects in our towns revolve around enhancing our bridges to accommodate larger flows and putting in larger culverts, just like the one you propose in your plan. These kinds of projects aren't necessarily glamorous. Uh, however, they are incredibly important and powerful tools to protect our community. So I commend you for the great thinking behind this project and wish you the very best in moving it forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, how about a round of applause for our three presenters? All the presentations today have been absolutely outstanding and just appreciate all the work that went in uh, to that, all the work that you have done. Uh, I think especially important, I want to thank Governor Cuomo, uh, Mayor de Blasio, and all the leaders for being here and, and spending all the time listening firsthand, which I think is, is, a, is a great reflection uh, and the respect they have for the work that you have done. And I also want to thank Lieutenant Governor Jamie Rubin for facilitating <laughs> this afternoon. <laughs> Make sure the press is still awake here. Um, we're going to take a 10-minute break. We have uh, one more part of the program. We have an awards ceremony for the New York Rising 
rising to the top competition. Uh, we're going to break for 10 minutes. Uh, so if you want to get up and stretch a little bit, and we'll be right back. Uh, see you in 10. Thank you.